Good day. This is Job Aguas, and welcome to my lectures on ethics. And today I'm going to discuss Aristotelian ethics. So first, some introduction. Uh, the, Aristot the works of Aristotle on ethics, there are basically two uh, important treatises on ethics written by Aristotle. These are the Nicomachean ethics and the Eudemian ethics. Uh, these two works cover almost uh, the same ground. They both start with a discussion of eudaimonia, which means happiness or flourishing, and then turn to an examination of the nature of arete, or virtue, or excellence. Of course, there are other some minor works of Aristotle on, on ethics. Now, ethics as science. Aristotle conceives ethics as a body of objective knowledge, as a systematic organization of concepts and principles or laws. Of course, it deals with the principles and concepts of ethics or moral conduct. Hence, it can be considered as a science. There are three types of knowledge or science that Aristotle uh, enumerates. First, you have the speculative or theoretical science. This is knowledge for the sake of knowledge. The second is practical knowledge or practical science. This is knowledge for the sake of the proper conduct of man. And the last one is productive science, the science or knowledge concerned with providing for the human, the human needs. Uh, ethics belongs to the second category, practical science, and it is concerned with the correct conduct that guides man towards a life of excellence or virtue. General notions. Central to Aristotle's ethics are the notions of happiness, virtues, freedom of the will, responsibility, and moral character. Like Socrates and Plato, he considers happiness as the end of human desires. He also considers the virtues as central to a well-lived life. I already mentioned in one of my discussions that um, the notion of happiness is something that is common among the Greek philosophers. So like Plato, he regards the ethical virtues, justice, courage, temperance, and wisdom as complex rational, emotional, and social skills. However, uh, Plato, or sorry, Aristotle rejects Plato's idea that a training in the sciences and metaphysics is a necessary prerequisite for a full understanding of our good. According to Aristotle, what we need in order to live well is a proper appreciation of the way in which such goods like friendship, pleasure, virtue, honor, and wealth fit together as a whole. So for Aristotle, knowledge in the sciences or knowledge about these concepts is not enough for us to be able to live well. He insisted that in order to apply general understanding or general understanding of the concepts to particular cases, we must acquire through proper upbringing and habits, the ability to see on each occasion, which course of action is best, meaning best supported by reason. Knowing the general rule is not enough. Knowing the concepts is not enough. One must be able the general rule or the concepts to real situations, which is done through good upbringing and good habits. So it's a very important that we have an experience in order for us to apply these concepts. Remember that for our Plato, our knowledge of these concepts are prior to any experience. So that's one big difference between Plato and Aristotle. And therefore, ethical life requires practical wisdom. And practical wisdom can be acquired solely by learning the general rules, because we need to practice, meaning to experience, to apply the general rules in order for us to fully understand them. 
We must also acquire through practice those deliberate emotional and social skills that enable us to put our general understanding of well-being into practice. And this is done through good upbringing. And we know that good upbringing starts with the family. Tato claims that the form of the moral good is independent of experience, personality, and circumstances, and that the moral evaluation of daily life is based on the knowledge of this good. Aristotle rejects this idea and insists that the basic moral principle is imminent, meaning it is innate in the activities of our daily lives and can be discovered only through a study of this daily activities. So, just to emphasize more on this, for example, we don't get to understand how to be good without being good ourselves. More concretely, how do we learn how to play a guitar? We play the guitar. We practice playing the guitar. We don't learn playing guitar by simply reading a book how to play it. Playing the guitar does not come from an a priori knowledge. It comes from experience coupled together with our knowledge of playing the guitar that we acquire from reading a book or learning under a teacher. But our teacher will still allow us to practice playing the guitar. That's the whole point of Aristotle. And the second is the notion of happiness or eudaimonia. And this is, as I've said, one over you no know, one overarching uh, uh, concept among the Greeks. Every action, according to Aristotle, and pursuit aims at some good. Hence, the good is what is that at which all things aim. He mentioned this in his uh, uh, the Comacan Ethics. And <clears throat> so, for Aristotle, goals like wealth and honors are not the ultimate desires of men. They are intermediate goals which must ultimately aim at some final good which we desire for its own sake. The ultimate good or the ultimate end of man must have the following characteristics. First, it must be self-sufficient, meaning that which even when isolated makes life desirable and lacking and in nothing. Consider, for example, money. Would money be self-sufficient? Would be ha will, will, will be would be happy? Would we be happy with only money? Eventually, we have even if we have all the monies in the world, we will still desire more and more. Next, it is final. That which is always undesirable in itself and never for the sake of anything. Again, consider money. Do you desire money for something else? Why do you desire money? If you can still give a reason why you desire money, then money is not yet the ultimate. You can say, well, I want money because I want to be happy. Consider, for example, fame. Why do you want to be famous? Well, because you want to be happy. Meaning these things, the material things, no, they are not yet the final because we can still desire something higher more than them. And of course, the last one is attainable. So, the goal that, ma that meets all these requirements according to Aristotle is happiness or eudaimonia. Because you don't desire happiness for something else. That's the end. You want to acquire a lot of things, become famous, acquire money, you know, become powerful because you want to be happy ultimately. Suppose I ask you, why do you want to be happy? Because you want to be famous? Because you want to be rich? Happiness is already the ultimate. There is no higher, no higher goal beyond or about happiness. So let me call this <clears throat> uh, beautiful passage from Aristotle. Happiness is the meaning and purpose of life, the whole aim and end of human existence. So happiness contains two vital concepts, reason and virtue. Happiness is related to the highest activity of the soul, which is reason. 
And reason is man's highest and distinctive function or activity. And happiness depends upon the actualization or full realization of our rationality. The purpose of human life stresses that it entails a life lived according to a certain plan or purpose furnished by reason. And reason involves two things, knowing or thinking and doing. And a good life involves both thinking and doing. The way to happiness is to follow or involves knowing the right principles and to follow and apply these principles in real life. The second concept is virtue. The performance of an activity must be in accordance with virtue or excellence or arete. Virtue refers to the excellence of a thing or the disposition to perform effectively its proper function. So it becomes a permanent disposition to always do the right or the proper function of a thing. And virtue, because it's, you know, <clears throat> it's a habit or excellence, it is attained through repeated action. So virtue is a habit, and a habit is formed by constant, constant repetition of action. You don't become just by simply doing one just act in your life. You become just by constantly being just to others. So for us, total happiness is not a passive state that we achieve, but it characterizes what we do and how we do it. So consider, for example, the opposite of virtue. Say, advice. Smoking, for example. First thing, you, first time you do it, it may not be very, very nice. But eventually, through constant repetition, you, it, you, it gives you pleasure. So you constantly repeat smoking until it becomes a vice. Consider the good habit of washing your hands, especially now during a time of crisis. If you every day wash your hands, then properly, then you acquire the good habit of washing your hands. So happiness is achieved by a virtuous person who lives according to reason, thus realizing his or her distinctive rational potentiality, constant. So a life of reason involves knowing the right principles and doing or practicing those principles. So two things, knowing the right principle and practicing the right principle. Now, let's go to the virtues. For Aristotle, virtue are good habits, as we have already mentioned. The proper or right way of doing something. The opposite of that, as we have already mentioned, is vice. When we do repeated good acts, good acts, we develop virtues. You do bad acts, you develop vices. Human virtues are human excellences, or the disposition to perform or act in a proper manner or way. So there are two types of virtues for Aristotle the moral virtues and the intellectual virtues. The intellectual virtues are intellectual excellences, meaning they are excellences of our rational faculty. The intellectual virtues are further subdivided into philosophic and practical wisdom. Philosophic wisdom is purely theoretical and achieved by understanding the unchanging structure of reality. Practical wisdom, on the other hand, is a rational understanding of how to conduct one's daily life. How to conduct one's daily life. Understanding the rules of conduct or norms of society and how to behave or act in a particular community are manifestations of practical 
wisdom. So if you are in this particular situation, like we are in a in a community, enhanced community quarantine, how do we act? We need to understand the rules. We need to understand the protocols of this quarantine and act accordingly. Follow them. That's practical wisdom. If you are told not to go out, stay home because of this and this and this and these reasons, then we have to obey. That's a manifestation of practical wisdom. The moral virtues concern the habitual choice of actions in accordance with rational principles. Moral virtues is the right disposition to make the right decisions and prudent action. Again, because it's a virtue, you don't, you know, you don't acquire it overnight. Moral virtue is not acquired overnight. It acquires, of course, through a series of good actions, prudent actions in your life. So, moral virtue is knowing how to make moral decisions and doing the right actions, not just knowing that certain actions or things are true or that certain actions are good or and right. Hence, we become just, according to Aristotle, by doing just acts. We become temperate by doing temperate acts. And we become brave or courageous by doing brave and courageous acts. Those of us who are not, you know, who don't struggle you know, following the rules, well, maybe because we have already developed that moral virtue. But for those who are still struggling how to follow the rules under these circumstances, it's time to start, you know, doing these things you know, and obtain the moral virtue for yourself. So, to enable us to balance our desires and emotions, we need more than intellectual virtues. We need moral virtues, the moral courage, the moral disposition to do what we are supposed to do. It's not enough to understand the theoretical truth or the principles underlying reality. We must be able to make a balance between our desires or and our emotions. A wise or intelligent individual personifies the intellectual virtues whereas the continent or moral individual personifies the moral virtue. Therefore, we must be both wise and continent. The excellence of a wise, of a wise person is attained through instruction and evidence by knowledge. The excellence of the continent or moral person is produced by habits of choice and expressed in practical actions tempered by both the circumstances and the individual. Needless to say that we have to acquire both. Virtue as a state of character. For Aristotle, there are three elements of human personality, passions, faculties, and states of character. As human beings, we feel, that's the passion, we desire, and we act. So the passions like anger and fear, and the faculties like the ability to feel anger and fear are not in and of themselves good or bad. So if you are angry, it does not mean that you have committed something bad. But they can be excessive and can be out of control. Therefore, they must be disciplined to follow the rational rules or principles. Virtuous state of character means that a morally good person is not just one who performs morally right actions, but one who has developed a habit or disposition to do what is right. He is one who has controlled his emotions, desires, and appetites. Remember what Confucius said about the virtue. It's not only for the sake of doing this because you want to establish, like for example, rent, because you want to establish 
good relationship. You do the virtue because of the love of the virtue. Your love for the virtue. So virtuous state of character is a disposition to always do the right thing. It's a permanent disposition to always do the right thing. And it really becomes a virtue, a permanent disposition. It becomes easy to do the right thing. Of course, you may struggle under some certain situations or conditions, but there's always the tendency to do the right thing. Okay? So if you have that disposition, you don't go around. If you have already contracted the virus, you don't go around meeting people and going to the hospital. A well-informed, well-formed character does not only tell the truth, but readily, happily, and easily tells the truth. And such character is manifested in one's motives, desires, and intention. Hence, the virtuous person delights in virtuous action and dislikes vicious or immoral actions. Next, virtue and the me. The virtue is a state of character, as we have said, concerned with choice, lying in a mean. And what is this mean? The mean is relative to us. That's quite difficult to understand. This mean being determined by a rational principle, and by that principle, by which the man of practical wisdom would determine it. So what does this mean by mean being relative to us? Every ethical virtue is a condition intermediate between two extremes, two extreme states, excess and deficiency. This is the mean, the doctrine of the mean, that we have to be at the middle of these two extremes, somewhat similar to the reversion of the Tao, right? When one goes to the other extreme, it reverses to the other extreme. So we have to stay at the middle. Okay, That is the doctrine of the mean, staying at the middle. Too much and too little are always wrong. The right kind of action always lies in the mean. The virtuous habit of action is always an intermediate state between the opposed biases of excess and deficiency. So, Aristotle writes in the Nicomachean Ethics, with respect to acting in the face of danger, Courage is a mean between the excess of rashness and the deficiency of cowardice. With respect to the enjoyment of pleasure, temperance is a mean between the excess of self-indulgence and the deficiency of insensibility. With respect to spending money, generosity is a mean between the excess of wastefulness and the, the deficiency of stinginess. With respect to relations with strangers, being friendly is a mean between the excess of ingratiating and the deficiency of being surly. And with respect to self-esteem, magnanimity or self-honesty is a mean between the excess of vanity or boastfulness and the deficiency of pusillanimity or self-depreciation. So here, I'm showing you uh, a table of uh, this sphere of feeling or action here. And then on both, this is the excess uh, vice, the deficiency vice, and the virtue at the middle. Okay, So between, uh, for example, uh, patience here is a virtue. That is the mean between the excess of irascibility and the deficiency of lack of spirit. See, 
That's the principle, the doctrine of the mean. <clears throat> the mean, according to Aristotle, will vary from situation to situation and from one individual to another. How courageous should you be, for example? If you're going to pass through a dark alley and there are thugs, you know, uh, there are thugs all over the place. Would you consider passing through the alley? It depends on the situation, right? So how brave you will you be? It depends. And the virtuous person will know whether he will proceed or not. Because if those thugs are really, say, they are mean, well, you have to be extra careful. But if you think those thugs are, well, they can be kind to you or you can just overcome them, then go ahead. So it depends on the situation. There is no universal rule or mathematical procedure that will determine the mean. It requires a full and detailed acquaintance with the circumstance. It's of the virtuous state of being that it naturally seeks its mean relative to us. So if you're on a diet, for example, what would be the mean of your diet? It depends on your condition. If you are, for example, uh, an athlete, <clears throat> maybe one cup of rice is not enough. That's not the mean for you. Maybe two. But if you're not an athlete, one is your is the mean for you. Just an analogy, of course. Right? So as human beings, we must aim and live a life that is in conformity with our rational nature. The satisfaction of our desires and the possession of material goods, though necessary for our material and physical well-being, are less important than the acquisition of virtue. Happiness is sustained through the appropriate balance between reasons and desires in the moderation of all things. Hence, true happiness can be attained only through the cultivation of the virtues that make a human life complete. Now, the next is voluntary action and moral responsibility. Moral evaluation and action presupposes the attribution of responsibility to a human agent, to the human person. <clears throat> Only those that are undertaken or performed voluntarily can have the element of responsibility. Remember our discuss, uh, remember the notion of human act must be performed with knowledge, with deliberation, and with voluntariness. The decisions to act voluntarily rely upon the deliberation about the choice among alternative actions that the individual could perform. During deliberation, individual actions are evaluated in the light of the good and some rational principles, and the best among them is then chosen for implementation. So we deliberate and then we do what we consider to be the right action. For Aristotle, there is a distinctive mode of thinking that provides adequately for morality. That is practical intelligence or prudence. Prudence comprehends the true character of the individual and community welfare and applies its results to the guidance of human action. Acting rightly or prudently involves coordinating our desires with correct thoughts about the correct goals or ends. This is the function of deliberative reasoning, to consider each of the many actions that are within one's power to perform, considering the extent to which each of these would contribute to the attainment of our goal or end. Happiness and the morally good person. Genuine happiness lies in action that leads to virtue, and since this alone provides true value and not just amusement. Aristotle holds that contemplation is the highest form of moral activity because it is continuous, pleasant, self-sufficient, and complete. A morally good person or the virtuous person is one who carefully follows reason, 
desires to do the right thing, has a well-formed character, knows the proper goals in life, and can deliberate how to achieve these goals and practice. And one was the most experienced in making difficult moral decisions. That I think is the basis of a happy, a good life for Aristotle. Only the virtuous person, the person who is like this, can have a good and happy life. So I will leave you with this beautiful quote from Aristotle. Excellence is an art won by training and habituation. We are what we repeatedly do. Excellence then is not an act, but a habit. That means a good habit. So thank you very much for listening. I hope you learn a lesson or two from this discussion. And as I always say, please be safe and God bless.